Father, thank you for the opportunity to live in another day and in another year. Uh, we know that you have plans for this year, for us as a church family, for each individual, for families. Uh, but there are so many things we have to look forward to. We also know that in this world there is tribulation, as the Lord promised. And uh, there's going to be times of pressure. We pray, Lord, today that you prepare our hearts for all things that we face this coming year. When now we open our hearts to your word, uh, where we are going to look at these six resolutions that the Apostle Paul gave to us in Ephesians chapter 5. We pray that they would be tied to our hearts all year long, that we might understand your will and your word, and how it applies to each day of our lives. In Christ's name we pray, amen. All right, turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. By now, most of you who follow the traditions of making New Year resolutions have already done so. And some of you have given up on doing that because you find it so easy to be that within three months a lot of them are already broken. But, uh, but if you've not made resolutions, there are two possibilities here from a couple of very famous people. One of them is Jonathan Edwards from, you know, many, year, many, many years ago, centuries ago, famous uh, preacher that, uh, you know, this famous sermon was Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God and what an impact it made upon people then. But he said, I will live for God, resolution number one, I will live for God, resolution number two, if no one else does, I still will. Okay? Uh, and then Leo Tolstoy, uh, the changes in our life must come from the impossibility to live otherwise than according to the demands of our conscience, not from our mental resolution to try a new form of life. So he goes a little deeper, doesn't he, <laughs> into what really causes a resolution in our hearts, the demands of our conscience. This morning I want to go to Ephesians 5 here as a resolute call from the Apostle Paul on how we use our time as followers of Christ. There are six great New Year's resolutions here that are designed for every year of our lives. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. All right, resolution number one, walk circumspectly. Walk circumspectly. Now Paul uses the word walk in his writings to describe one's conduct or lifestyle. So conduct your lifestyle circumspectly is what he's saying here. Now when he began the sentence with the word see, he was saying to look forward to where your walk is going and where it's about to take you. Look closely at what's ahead. And uh, then the word circumspectly means to carefully trace things out accurately, uh, or you might say objectively. The picture that comes to my mind is to carefully plan out where you want to go and make the most accurate appraisal of things, your goals, your relationships, your motivations, all of these things. And it's like carefully planning a trip, that you're going to go somewhere, you've got to carefully plan things. Now let me use a vacation trip that Vicki and I made with our children a long time ago. Uh, we'll really use it like a parable for this very thing about walking circumspectly. When they were still in school, uh, we decided that before Joel graduated that we would take a family vacation to Yellowstone National Park. And that, but we had a very small travel budget. So we had to plan our trip extremely carefully. First of all, our family, a family that we knew, gave us the use of a cabin just outside the park there, the Elson National Park, free of charge for a week. Well, that was taken care of, and it was a fantastic place, no, no amenities to speak of, but we had fun playing games in the evenings and that kind of thing. So it was, a, it was right across from a lake that was created by an earthquake. So it was a very interesting time together for our family. Uh, that, uh, uh, next we had to decide, well, how are we going to get there? And how much is it going to cost us? So we found round-trip tickets, airline tickets, to Salt Lake City, Utah. Now, I know that's a long ways from Montana. But we had to make this work somehow. 
So we found round trip ticket, uh, airline tickets to Salt Lake City, Utah, including a small rental car for $525. That's for five people. Couldn't beat that, could you? But we had to drive all the way to Louisville and store our car there for that week in order to get that low of a rate. So we drove 150 miles north and, and uh, then we flew back into Louisville on the way back. So, uh, you know, circumspectly, if things are going well so far, well, we were doing pretty well with our circumspect plans except for two things. We stopped at the Rocky Mountain Museum on the way and we put Vicky's purse in our camera case on the floorboard of the back seat where we thought they would be safe. The problem was that someone in a nearby camper had watched the whole thing, broke out a back window, and stole the purse and camera case. And uh, the, the museum informed us that that was the first time anything had ever gotten stolen there in the whole history of the museum. We were the first, you know. And uh, so we did, what we did, you see, was not circumspect enough. We didn't think about what we were doing with enough caution, uh, not understanding that that could possibly happen to us. Well, I vacuumed out the broken glass and taped a trash bag over the space where the window had been. And every day the kids argued over who had to sit by the trash bag side, you know. <laughs> Listen to it flap in the wind. And then they couldn't see out the window either, you know. The second not so circumspect decision we made happened on the way back to Salt Lake City. We were concerned about a traffic tie-up on the interstate. So I looked at the map and what, there was what appeared to be a nice shortcut, you know, over a small mountain, you know, and so that we could get there in plenty of time. So we veered off the interstate, started up that mountain, and the roads were real windy and slow, you know, and then a herd of cattle was crossing the road in front of us, and we had to stop for that herd of cattle for a while, and we barely got to the airport on time. Not so circumspect to take that shortcut. It was an impulsive decision. You see what Paul's talking about? Circumspect and impulsiveness don't go together too well, you know. As you can tell, there were consequences to not walking, driving, or flying necessarily circumspectly. The motto of this little parable is to plan out a circumspect life journey and stay the course. Resolution number two, walk not as fools walk. Now there are more than 360 scriptures in the Bible defining what it is to be a fool. The book of Proverbs gives special attention to it. Vicki has a book entitled, uh, Foolproofing Your Life, and I probably need to read it. A general description of a foolish person emerges from these scriptures. Uh, they describe the foolish person as one who is thoughtless, self-centered, greedy, and indifferent to God. The backflip to that description, of course, provides some addendum resolutions under the resolution not to walk as fools walk. And that would be resolutions like be thoughtful, be other-centered, be generous, be sensitive, and be respectful to God and his ways. In fact, Proverbs 1 7 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Resolution number three, walk or live as one who is wise. Be a wisdom seeker. This is a person who seeks to acquire knowledge and makes practical application according to that knowledge. Wisdom is the practical application of it. There's a wisdom that comes from God, and we are invited by the Lord to ask him for it. James 1.5 says, uh, indicating this very promise, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. William Barclay writes that wisdom from the Lord is a practical issue of understanding how to apply the knowledge of God's word and to do it in a righteous manner. In other words, wisdom is what helps us do the right thing at the right time and in the right way. Circumspect wisdom. It's clear that God delights to generously give us his wise counsel when we ask for it. Always ask. When I get into trouble, it's because I haven't asked for his wisdom. And sometimes I've asked and he gave it and I didn't follow it. 
You know, that's another thing. The verb form of let him ask is literally let him continue to ask, or, or her continue to ask. Asking for God's wisdom should preface every decision that we make. It is God's wisdom that helps us to walk circumspectly instead of walking as a fool. There is a natural wisdom too. And God's actually created that as well. Because natural wisdom is intelligence. It's, it's instinctive. It's based on logic. Our ability to reason. Uh, education. Lessons learned in life. And so it can be philosophical too if that philosophy matches up with what is true. And perhaps some of us are resolved this year to pursue more natural wisdom, such as more education. I'm actually resolving this year to begin working on finishing a graduate degree. I started a long, long time ago when I was in my 20s. <laughs> that was a long time ago, wasn't it? Uh, but I'm going to do it. You're never too old to do that, are you? So, pursue knowledge that you can apply with God's wisdom. Number four, resolution number four, redeem the time because the days are evil. The word redeem here means to buy up the time or to rescue the time from loss. A lot of resolutions for a new year have to do with how a person spends his or her time. The question is, how much time do we have? And you know, those of you who have been here a while know that I love this illustration, this, this uh, thought-provoking article entitled, If You Were 35, You Have 500 Days to Live. Uh, its thesis was that when you subtract the time spent sleeping, working, tending to personal matters, hygiene, odd chores, medical matters, eating, traveling, and miscellaneous time stealers, in the next 36 years, you will have roughly the equivalent of only, seven, of only 500 days left to spend as you wish. Other people and other things are taking up the rest of your time. 500 days. No wonder the psalmist advice, so teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. Be wise in redeeming, redeeming the time. A large number of people over 95 were asked the question, and it was an open-ended question, how they would live their lives differently if they had an opportunity, and no religion was connected to it, no anticipated response. They were just to give short responses to that question. And there were three answers that came back more than any others. One was, I would reflect more. Another one was, I would risk more. And third, I would do more things that would live on after I'm dead. What a great way to redeem the time. I think there is a second application for this resolution to redeem the time as well. Time as it's used here may mean an era or a time period that's going on in, in culture or uh, a time frame of the world in which Paul was living at the time perhaps. But in thinking of it this way, we would resolve to be a part of rescuing time or the culture we live in to rescue it from loss. And this is what Jesus meant when he said, you are the salt of the earth. It was to preserve and then rescue from loss those things uh, where those things are contaminating our world. In the time period that Paul wrote these words, the Ephesian Christians lived in a culture dedicated to idolatry and to the occult. He wrote this letter while under house arrest in Rome, under the dictates of the Roman emperor Nero. And the cultural environment was one of moral depravity. Indeed, the days were evil that Paul wrote these words in. But he had this vision, I think, in his heart that through Jesus Christ, the, that culture, that time could be redeemed from loss. And over time, much of the evil of that era was overcome, and the influence of the body of Christ certainly had a redeeming quality in the surrounding world. Redeeming the time means that we commit ourselves to helping to change the environment of our world. The days are evil and they need to be rescued from loss. The only way we can do that is to be willing to step outside the box and touch the lives of people out in the world with the love of Christ. I've been talking a lot about being more assertive in our ministry to people out in the world. 
to the broken and brokenhearted and to those who are held captive and those kinds of things like the mission that Jesus had. And I guess that that is part of this resolution in my heart as well. Let's be assertive believers and Christians that carry the message out into the world and to reach out to those who are hurting and going through difficult times. One day, back in the 19th century, a Sunday school teacher told an illiterate 20-year-old 20 uh, 20 Dwight L. Moody, a shoe salesman, about God's love for him. D.L. Moody became a follower of Jesus that day. And he was transformed over time into a great evangelist that led thousands and thousands of people to Christ. He didn't even know how to read and write when he was, gave his heart to Christ. His wife taught him how to do that. But God used him in a mighty way. He even spoke to great universities in places where a lot of times he was mocked and taunted because of his horrible use of the English grammar. But they got saved. Many of them, hundreds, were saved in those universities. And he founded the YMCA as an outreach to boys living out on the streets of Chicago. What was Moody doing? He was redeeming the, his time from loss. David Wilkerson was a small town country preacher in Pennsylvania when he decided to reach out to drug addicts and gang members in New York City. And the result of that was that he established then hundreds of Christian recovery programs all over the world. And they're still going today after many decades. I directed one of them myself. Redeeming his time. Redeeming from loss. That's what it means to redeem the time. Resolution number five. Understand what the will of the Lord is. Clearly we can best redeem the time when we understand what is the will of the Lord. Uh, Jesus told his followers at the Last Supper something that he wanted them to remember about his will. It was in the form of what he called a new commandment. He said, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. And by this shall all men know that you're my disciples, because you have love one for another. So we're going to start with that, because I, I, I love that song, Jude, about, you know, love like a hurricane, man. That's kind of a, that's a graphic image, isn't it? What does it mean? It's a love that's greater than any other, you know. But it sweeps into our hearts and lives and changes us. So... Understand what the will of the Lord is, and that's to love one another. In fact, Paul began his exhortation about walking according to the will of God in Ephesians 4, verse 1, where he said, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. It is the will of God that we love one another with humility with gentleness and patience you know that again we go back to the narrow way don't we and Jesus said it's a difficult way why is it difficult because it requires us to be long-suffering with one another and with other people when we do that though when we walk in humble long-suffering love then other things begin to operate according to the will of God in our lives if you skip over first base when you're playing in a ball game, if you skip over first base and you make it all the way to home, you're going to get called out. Especially if they throw that ball over there. If somebody noticed it, they throw that ball over there because you never touch that first base. Unless we are dedicated and resolute to love one another as he has loved us and we skip first base. And it doesn't work after that. What else is the will of God? There is God's sovereign will. These are things that God has decided will happen regardless of what anyone else thinks or says about it. Jesus coming as the Christ, the incarnate Son of God, living a sinless life among us, being crucified as an atonement for our sins, as the Lamb of God, being raised up, ascending into heaven, to pour out his spirit upon his followers was and is God's sovereign will. It was going to happen and no one was going to be able to stop it. Although Herod tried.
There are over 300 messianic prophecies in the Old Testament. Did you know that Jesus fulfills them all? What are the odds of that? It's because of God's sovereign will. It is the sovereign will of God that there be a second advent as well. When Jesus Christ will return with the saints and establish his kingdom upon this earth. And no one can stop it. And as you know in the book of Revelation we learn that the devil will certainly give it a, a hard try. To stop the kingdom of God from being established on this earth. Then thirdly there is God's moral will. This includes the boundaries that God's word gives us to live by. Now please know though that this is far more than the Ten Commandments. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus spoke of how the righteousness we live by needs to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees who were dedicated to keeping the law. They were dedicated to keeping the Ten Commandments. Jesus spoke of how the law and the prophets though are summed up by these words, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. When we are dedicated to walking in love, then we will keep the commandments from the heart. Our walk with Christ is not a system of rules, but of loving relationship. A woman approached a friend of mine one time and, and invited him to have an affair with her. He replied to that woman, you know, I love Jesus too much, and I love my wife too much to do that. He did not need to review the commandment, you shall not commit adultery. He loved his Lord, and he loved his wife and his children too much to do it. It is the will of God that we are being conformed to the character and the nature of Jesus, God's Son. Romans 8.29 says, For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That is the will of God. Paul prefaced this statement with the promise that God works all th with all things together for good, to those that love him and are called according to his purpose. What is his purpose? That's to reconstruct us to be like his son Jesus. That is the will of God for all of us. He uses whatever materials that we give him to use uh, for this new construction. He even uses our trials. He will use our failures and bad decisions even to help us relearn how to live and relate to others doesn't say he works only with the good things in our lives for good. He works with difficult things and bad things in our lives too to help conform us to the image of his son. Number five, it is his will to make decisions uh, based on his wisdom. Paul wrote, do not be unwise when he said, but uh, know the will of God, understand the will of God. Many of us would like for God to write on the wall or something, wouldn't we? Now you might remember that comes out of the Old Testament and that was done for a guy who was obstinate and rebellious against God. You know. And it was a warning. You know, typically God doesn't write on a wall for everybody. Uh, that's a very rare thing <laughs> that's been done. Or we want God to just outright tell us what to do. You know, would you just tell me what to do? I even have people ask me that sometimes. Pastor, would you tell me what to do? And I say, you know what? That's not, you know, something I want to get into. I want you to ask God, you know, to lead you into making a good decision here, you know. He has designed the program so that we interact with him and listen to him in our personal relationship with him as our father. You know, there's a bullseye theory that, that verses the unfolding of his plan through the transfer of his wisdom into our thinking. The bullseye theory is that there is a sort of sweet spot that we have to locate and then we have to strive real hard to hit it and to hit it dead on right in the center you know and so we strive and we strive and we strive and say I've got to hit that sweet spot you know the bullseye theory but understanding God's will does not usually work like that God though will place in our hearts what he determines is best and what he determines is wise for us when we are willing to wait on him I read an essay on discovering God's will that described it as a process like the unfolding of petals on a rose. They don't all unfold at the same time. Layer upon layer they unfold into something very beautiful at the end. 
And so God's will is usually revealed little by little, layer upon layer, petal upon petal, like a rose. We are more likely to hit the bullseye by slowing down, checking the motives of our hearts, and waiting for wisdom and peace from God. Paul wrote, let the peace of God rule in your heart. And unwise decisions are often made when we are angry. That's when we get impulsive sometimes. We're angry and so we decide to do something impulsive or discouraged or going through grief following a major loss or disappointment. Then there is the temptation to act impulsively, to manipulate or to try and force something to happen. And that's where we miss God's plan. Another thing that can get in the way of understanding the will of God is listening to other people more than the wise counsel of God. Perhaps we've all experienced that. I learned a while ago that too often the voices that we hear seeking influence in our lives are based in someone else's agenda. That person's own agenda. Whether it be a public figure that we're listening to, who's a politician or, or whatever, or a book that we've read or even a person you can count on as a friend. Uh, sometimes there's even things there that we have to kind of work our way through. It's okay, guys, to resolve not to be manipulated by anyone and resolve that the understanding the will of God is the main thing. Years ago, someone advised me with these words. They said to me to not immediately believe anything that I hear and only half of what I think I'm seeing. The only completely reliable filter is the wisdom of God and His Word. The next trans uh, resolution, number six, is found in verse 18 of Ephesians chapter 5. Resolution number six. And do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now at first glance there seems to be two resolutions here, doesn't there? One being do not be drunk with wine, and the other one being but be filled with the Spirit. Two resolutions? Well really it's more of a rather than or an instead of kind of thing. Being under the strong influence of wine leads to the breakdown in a person's judgment and in wise de and unwise decision making begins to happen. There is a consequence of lost time, of lost jobs, lost relationships, and lost opportunities due to that. And Paul refers to it as dissipation. Dissipation means to break down rather than to restore. It's actually a word that means the opposite of salvation, where salvation builds a person up. And restores them to wholeness and kind of gets them going again and, and moving in the right direction. Well, dissipation is what takes you away from that and begins to break down a person's life. And it could be other things other than wine that do that as well. So being under the influence of the Spirit, the invisible presence of God, actually heightens the ability to understand the will, the will of God and the wisdom of God it redeems the time that we've been given. The Spirit fills us in order to transform us to wholeness, the opposite of dissipation, and our minds with the mind of Christ. That's what happens with the indwelling Spirit. His objective is to renew our minds so that we can think like Jesus. In John 16, 13, Jesus said concerning the promise of the Spirit, However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. All things that the Father has are mine, therefore I said that he will take of mine and declare it to you. Isn't that the most amazing thing in the world? That what Jesus has been given by the Father, you know, what he's saying, what I've been thinking, the way I've been doing things, you're going to be able to do that too. You're going to be able to think like I think. Because the Father has given that to me to give to you. The Spirit. Inside of us, guys, is a place where the Spirit of God lives and desires to fill us with His presence. And just as the things represented by being drunk with wine had an influence over us that was dissipating, causing us to act like fools and make foolish choices, so the Holy Spirit does the opposite. He influences us by giving wisdom, 
to redeem the time and fulfill the will of God for our lives. The encouragement in 2016 is that we ask daily for the filling and the influence of His Spirit over our lives. You want to live life to the fullest? We can't do it alone. We need God's help. We need the Holy Spirit in us, helping us to fulfill God's plan and His will. So every day, say, and, and I do this, you know, Lord, fill me with your Spirit. Fill me with your Spirit that I might understand your will in my life, and that I might be able to redeem the time from loss. This, in this year, let's be praying every day. Father, and that's what Jesus was talking about in Luke chapter 11, when he said, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking, for it's God's good pleasure, the Father's good pleasure, to give you the Holy Spirit when you ask. Wow, ask for it. So, I don't know how many of you have made New Year's resolutions. If you have, consider adding these six to your list. If you've not made a list, then you consider these are resolutions that will make life much better for us all. Look at them again. Number one, walk circumspectly. Two, walk not as fools walk. Three, walk or live as one who is wise. Be a wisdom seeker. Four, redeem the time because the days are evil. And five, understand what the will of the Lord is. And number six, and do not be drunk with wine in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Let's stand together. I hope you noticed something here that... Uh, None of these resolutions are things that we have to just grit our teeth and say, I'm going to do this if it kills me. These are all things that come as gifts from God. His wisdom, His will, you know, the, the transformation of our thinking, you know, the ability to redeem the time. All of those things are gifts from the Lord. They are by His grace, not our own efforts. So our job is simply to be open to it. To open our hearts to him and say, do it, Lord. Do it in me. All right? We don't have to be like a lot of other resolutions. You know, I'm going to lose 30 pounds. I'm going to do it. You know. I'm going to exercise every day. <sighs> well, I'm going to do it. You know. I'm going to do it. You know. Uh, I don't know what. I'm not going to speed, you know, on the highway. Well, most people break that pretty quickly. You know. But uh, anyways... We don't have to gut this out. It's a gift from God. It's by His grace that we do these things. Father, thank you for that. Thank you that you did not leave us alone, that you gave us this wonderful gift of your favor and your grace because you loved us. We do ask, Father, that within our hearts and minds that you would place hope to give us a vision on how we can be a part of redeeming our world from loss the time that we live in today. We know, Lord, that you have something that you can give us all to do in your name in this world. So open our eyes to see it. And motivate us by your Spirit to step out in faith and be assertive as believers this coming year to make a difference in our world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys. I'm looking forward to this the rest of this year. Uh, what God's going to do, how he's going to help us through everything. Looking forward to hanging out with you guys a lot. Uh, and we're going to have a wonderful year. And we're going to have a, a difficult year. And we're going to have, a, you know, a year that we don't know where it's going sometimes. A confusing year at times. It's all going to be there. But one thing we have, you know, working in our behalf is there's an absolute God with an absolute love for us. And, uh, and he loves us. All right? So hang on to that, even if it's for dear life sometimes. <laughs> if you want prayer, come on up to the front after the benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. May you have a, a year that is fruitful and filled with hope. May God bless you with good health. May he prosper your life, especially your soul and your mind, with the transformation. And may you enjoy working with the Lord and transforming and redeeming our world. In Christ's name, amen.